Hi, this is Don Evans, and I want to welcome you to the Inside Source Executive Video Series. With me today, I have Tim McBride. He's the GM Finance Operations at Microsoft, a brand new title. Tim, thank you for joining me today. Thanks. Pleasure to be here, Don. So I'm pretty excited. We're right here in, in Seattle. You can just feel yeah. the innovation in the air. We're in your backyard. So tell me a little bit about what's going on at Microsoft today. Well, you know, we are super excited about uh, Windows 8 that's coming out, uh, and um, you know, we're busy at work preparing for that. Uh, the Windows Phone is pretty exciting, so I don't know if you had a chance to look at our, our latest update. It's codenamed Mango or uh, Windows 7.5, but uh, that's a whole new paradigm for phones, so we're, we're feeling really bullish about that. And obviously the Xbox and the Kinect have done really well and I think revolutionized you know, uh, a whole new way of interacting with computers. So uh, we're pretty excited about that and certainly about the future and where those three products can lead. Could I ask a, a personal favor? Could you slow down on the Xbox innovation? <laughs> You're costing me an arm and a leg. I've got kids that love your product. So. Yeah, well, you only need one Kinect device, so there you go. <laughs> so we've had you at SIG before, and we've talked about procurement transformation. Yeah. And your story is very compelling, and, and a lot of people have asked us to bring you back and tell it again. But tell me, what were some of the secrets to your success for transformation? Well, you know, we were at an interesting place uh, when we started the transformation because we were a very distributed uh, procurement organization. We had uh, reporting structures that were kind of spread out, uh, but we had some very core key assets, I think, that, that really helped. We had pretty good data and analytics. Uh, so you could say we knew we had a problem, we just didn't have a solution for the problem. Uh, and so we were not very effective as an organization because of the spread nature. Uh, and you know, not really very efficient either. So you know, we, we looked at a multi-part plan and we put that multi-part plan together that included you know, changing the organization, it, in, it included um, really beefing up our sourcing strategy and sourcing expertise, and it really meant transforming the people who were in the organization as well in many respects. So we did a lot of additional training uh, and really kind of a, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about how do we become more, uh, more impactful to finance and more impactful to the company because uh, we really viewed you know, our door through finance as being super important. And so you know, laying that plan out and then executing against each of those elements, I think, you know, was super, super important. I guess at the end of the day, if you're saying you know, keys to success, I, I would say it was the data and the analytics, uh, at, at least in our culture, that really does kind of rule. So understanding where that's going to lead you, who are the biggest spenders at the company, who are the largest suppliers, uh, and then what controls can you put in place around all of that, I think was, was super critical. And then, um, you know, language and communication. So, and by that I mean, you know, understanding what, uh, what finance and what the business is really looking for from procurement. Because mm -hmm. uh, part of our measures was, you know, when we talked about effectiveness, it was what do our business partners perceive of us? Uh, and how early will we be brought into the processes and what kind of impact will we have on budget. Uh, and so it was super important that we you know, really thought about the language that we use and how we uh, align our plans together, uh, how we're involved in the planning cycle, and then how do we validate the savings that we do get to, to reflect back, certainly to the finance organization as well as the business leaders, the impact that we're having and how they can use those savings uh, to either reinvest or uh, take it to the bottom line and, and reduce cost. So as the CPO, how did you keep your agenda to, to stay on the top of the mind of the CEO, the CFO, the COO? How did you get their attention so that they would support your agenda? Well, I mean, th there were key sponsors, obviously, of the transformation. So that, that's super helpful. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're embedded then and in, in interested in your success. That was, that was critically important. And then, frankly, there was the, the luck of timing in some respects because we had the economic crisis that happened you know, literally year one into the transformation. Um, we had some pretty serious economic issues, uh, as, as did everybody in this country and around the globe. Uh, and that really elevated the conversation, I think, uh, and the sense of urgency that was around it. So I think it would have happened anyway. That certainly just sped up the process. Uh, and certainly put us top of mind. I guess the, the good news is that was so successful and the collaboration there was so deep and so, so well done that uh, we stayed at, at the top of, of mind uh, and uh, really didn't lose that, that impact uh, and were able to continue to be part of the planning process, to be part of the business planning process, uh, and certainly part of the budget cycle, which is so important. Um, since I align through finance, that's kind of the language and the, the timing elements that we used as part of the planning process. And that opens the door for your sourcing teams, it opens the door for negotiating, it opens the door for you know, really being there when it counts, uh, when strategy decisions are being made that involve vendor selection or 
our vendor decisions. So we just had the pleasure of having you and Tammy Reller, the CFO, CMO of Microsoft Live and yeah. Windows, um, up on the stage. A amazing conversation. We had people saying, I wish you, that was their entire morning session for four <laughs> hours, which would have been wonderful. It was fun. Um, but you know, CFOs and CPOs quite often don't talk the same talk, and they don't, they're not that supportive of one another. So how did you and Tammy really solve this problem? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because I don't, I don't think of us necessarily as not talking the same language per se. I think we have different sets of priorities. And understanding the different, different priorities and certainly the timing around those priorities, I think, is, is, is super important. For Tammy and I, you know, the conversation really did start in that economic crisis time. And, um, you know, she was tasked at how do we think about uh, the, what are, in essence, the levers we can pull to reduce costs at the company? What can we do quickly? What's going to take longer term? Uh, and she and I sat down and at first just had a kind of a brainstorming session. So I brought in, again, all this data that we had. Uh, an understanding of you know where the spend was happening, uh, where the supplier fragmentation looked like by business group, by geography, uh, and that was super helpful. And uh, you know the conversation really just started with you know Tim, what do you think? What are some what are some things we might do? Uh, which is you know the CPO's dream because you know to be asked you know where do you see opportunity is a wonderful thing. Uh, and we ended up with 15 or 20 you know ideas that uh, we thought would help drive down cost, and we had a target we were trying to hit. Uh, and so, you know, we added those things up, went through the data analysis again, uh, and some of those things, uh, you know, some of the elements that we were looking at uh, were pretty tough to do and tough to execute. So uh, senior level support and, and sponsorship for those activities uh, was critical because in some cases we were saying, you know, we're going to change the way work gets done. We're going to change elements of the culture here, uh, which is a pretty serious change management problem. Uh, and you know, do we all agree from senior leadership down that we'll support this idea? Uh, and so we worked very closely together on all of those elements. And, and you know, as I said, that was super helpful. Uh, and I think you know, if um, there's the one big success story out of that, it was the fact that you know we've kept it up, we've kept it going, and I think that's been been critical. So, what kind of advice would you give to other executives on how to to start, kick off a transformation, lead a transformation? What are some of your, your critical success factors that you would? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, each transformation, I think, has very different elements. Uh, so understand your corporate culture uh, and understand the, the problem that you're really trying to solve in the corporate culture uh, first and, and make sure you've got alignment with, you know, your senior leaders mm -hmm. so you're solving the right problem. Right. Uh, and then I think, you know, you've got to take it in parts. I think it's, it's, it's super important that you identify what are the, the biggest rocks you need to get moved. Uh, and the plan against executing those. And then finally, you know, change management is a critical, critical part of the whole process. And certainly it's one, my learning was in part, how much investment you need to make in change management. Uh, I initially kind of poo-pooed it. It's like, well, sure, you send a few emails out and you tell people we're changing a few things and how hard can it be? Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. And so the number of one-on-one -on -one conversations that you need to have, the uh, teaching within your own organization so that at various levels of the organization the communications are happening, providing those kinds of templates for communication uh, and a timing and a plan that's pretty clear so people mm -hmm. see the steps, where you're going and how they're going to get there. Uh, all of that actually ended up being a lot of the time that we invested was just how do we communicate this, what are the changes, how's it going to impact people at various levels, and then tailoring those messages uh, so that they landed appropriately. Uh, I think was, you know, super, super critical. So, you know, um, it's often one of those things that people kind of, you know, uh, dismiss a little bit because we're so focused on the, you know, the core elements of our job, what we think of as our job, that communication piece, certainly with your CPO or any senior leader, it's, uh, your job is really more about communication almost than it is, you know, it is, the big yeah. things that you're doing. So, um, you know, invest a lot of time there. Uh, and make sure that you're continually aligned, again, you know, sort of with the desire for the transformation, that you're achieving the right goal. So you, you talked um, about talent acquisition, talent management a little bit with Tammy, mm -hmm. and you said some fascinating things that you actually bring people in from finance into procurement, which is not a normal career path for a lot of people. Talk about how you, you manage your talent and, and get the best talent, because you are known for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that I, uh, I believe is that if you want to be well aligned with the businesses, it, it helps to have somebody from that business who understands that business come into procurement. Uh, and actually, as a, just as a hiring philosophy, I'm one who tends to hire more on what I think of as the innate abilities of a person or their future capabilities of a person as opposed to 
their job experience or job skill. There's uh, you, you know, effective communication and effective problem solving is a very difficult talent to find. Uh, I can teach someone sourcing. So I would, I would rather hire a person who you know, is very good at those, those kinds of uh, convincing conversations with reluctant stakeholders. Uh, and so setting up interview questions and uh, scenarios that are more focused on that rather than tell me about your most recent sourcing uh, activity and you know, what your savings results were, I actually find far more effective. Um, so we look for that. And uh, I think that helps us you know, develop the right talent. And as I said before, you know, in some ways, we're fortunate. Uh, a company of our size with, you know, depending on the brand survey you look at, the fourth to uh, third most valuable brand in the world is, uh, you know, makes it relatively easy to attract some good talent uh, from around the globe. Um, so that's a blessing. Uh, and I realize not everybody has that blessing. But, um, it, which is why, again, you know, I go back to look internally, look to finance folks, look to business folks uh, who are maybe looking for a change in their career. Uh, and uh, many find procurement a fascinating place, as I have learned to find procurement a fascinating <laughs> place uh, over time. So, uh, it, you know, this can be a great career uh, advancement and opportunity for them as well. So, can I talk about the cloud? Sure. Okay. So, please do. <laughs> is this the greatest innovation to have ever come, or is this just a new way of looking at something that's been around? Tell me, what is Microsoft's view of the cloud? Yeah, well, for, for us, the cloud is a huge investment. I think the cloud is a paradigm shift in uh, the way business gets done and certainly the way IT gets done. And, you know, from our perspective, we aren't looking at it as a, you know, a marketing ploy or those kinds of things. Uh, you look at the depth of investment that we're making. We're, we're re-architecting every product at the company. We're changing our entire sales model. We're changing our financial systems to track a completely different way of, of the way we sell, the way we track the revenue and so on. Uh, uh, the, the cloud is a fundamental shift in the way businesses and companies will work. And I, you know, I, I like to cast it in sort of a procurement uh, point of view. The cloud is great for um, variability and scale and scope of activity. So if you're uh, you know, a, a, a tax firm, for example, you're going to be very busy at quarter ends. You're going to be very busy in that January to April time frame. And then things slow down dramatically. So, uh, you know, if you're an H&R block, you, you can build a giant data center and, and all these servers and all the software that goes with it for the, your capacity peak. Or you could borrow somebody else's capacity that's, you know, not being used by sharing that in a, in a large data center. Uh, and at Microsoft, we're building not just the data centers and the servers, uh, like some of our competitors are doing, but we're actually putting Windows on the, on the cloud. We're putting Office 365 now uh, as a cloud offering. And that really is a reach down to you know, smaller businesses as well as large enterprises uh, that you, know, you have the latest software, you don't need an IT department, you don't need a bunch of servers, uh, you don't need uh, a help desk person who's you know, there in your office if you're a 20 or 50 person or 100 person firm. Uh, all of that's provided for you. You have the latest software, the latest updates, your operational costs go down and so on. So we think there's just a number of business advantages that the cloud offers uh, that are unique uh, to that kind of offering. That, all that said, we're not uniquely about the cloud either, right? We're, we're still in the, uh, the licensing business, so we'll still sell you, you know, licenses that sit on your, your computer on your desktop. You can still go to the store and, and buy a PC and plug it in, and it'll have Windows running. Um, and so we, we, we believe it's really a continuum, and it's a, a different set of solutions for either different departments or different businesses, depending on their needs. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll be transitioning to this kind of more cloud-like world, if you will, uh, over the next uh, you know, quite a few years. But for us, it's a significant investment and uh, a significant priority. But have the security risks changed? I mean, has anything around security really changed with the use of the cloud? We've been putting information yeah. on the internet, so what has changed in that regard? Yeah, well, certainly uh, protection of, of, uh, uh, of your IP as well as your personally identifiable information, I'm having a hard time getting that out, or PII, as we call it, uh, is critical. And so you need to look at um, you know, the, the data that you want very close to you. So think of this as high business impact kind of data. Mm -hmm. Could be your financials, your HR records, those kinds of things. There's a private cloud offering which says, you know, only you have access to these servers, only you have access to that data, only you have access to that um, uh, set of operating systems and so on. Less cloud value to that because you get some of the scalability, but, you know, it's still primarily your environment, you're paying for your environment. Um, 
That said, you know, there's a lot of other data that you have that doesn't have the same sets of sensitivity around it, and so uh, can be scalable apps. And so that's why we believe in this kind of mixed model. You'll probably, most large corporations will have what we think of as sort of a private cloud just for their, their high business impact data, and then uh, other things that are sitting out on a public cloud, um, perhaps less sensitive. Uh, and so, you know, scaled offerings, scaled uh, capability. In terms of, you know, security, I, I think it's well known that, that we are, take security very, very seriously. Um, we send out you know, all the updates, all the patches, all those things to the software to make sure that it's as locked down as it possibly can be. And certainly in a cloud environment you know, with things like Azure or Office 365, we do all those updates for you as a customer. So you don't have to worry about, you know, is my PC maintained with the latest version or the latest security patch or update? That all gets done. So, uh, again, you know, looking at that smaller mid-market kind of business scenario, uh, it's actually, I would argue, more secure in most cases. Uh, if you don't have an IT department, if you're not sort of on top of your security updates all the time, uh, having you know, us do that for you mm -hmm. is a big win. Good. All right, so you've now said there's life after CPO. Yeah. So let's talk about your new transition and, yeah. and what's going on there. Uh, well, I'm excited because uh, we were able to, to bring in some great talent over the last few years. As uh, you know, as I filled out a succession plan for my CPO role, and then I've recently moved to uh, what's called financial operations. That's basically all of the uh, payroll, royalties, payments, uh, accounts payable activity, uh, the buy center part of procurement, so the, the buy center operational piece, uh, and all of the record activity, financial record activity, uh, globally uh, for the 112 countries that we do business in. So uh, very much a core finance kind of role, so much more finance than, uh, than procurement, uh, as you might say, and uh, a nice next step uh, in the organization. So I'm super excited about it. I think it um, is a nice next progression for me personally, uh, and I think we've built a really nice bench uh, in the procurement organization, and um, you know, they'll be doing great, and we have a great new CPO in that role. Uh, and so, you know, I, th I think it's nice to be able to see that there is, as you said, life, life after CPO, uh, and it's not just, you know, uh, a dead-end job, and it's certainly a, a part of a career path, which is, which is uh, super fun. Now, is this an organization that existed, or an organization they created for you to lead? Uh, no, this was an existing organization, so, okay. uh, and we're, we're, we're doing some transformation I was going to say, too. so when's the transformation Yeah, yeah, start? we're doing some transformation <laughs> there, too, so over time, it'll, uh, it'll evolve. So can we bring you back to tell that story as well? Uh, sure, absolutely. Well, yeah. good. Give, give me a year or so. I'll give, well, a year transformation, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. Yeah, I, I've pleasure. always enjoyed, I've, I've loved learning from you for the last, what, five years that I've been able to watch you and, yeah. and observe all your transformation and you're an incredible leader. So thanks. I'm sure and, we're going to be uh, hearing big it, things about you. It's always a pleasure to be here at SIG. Well, thank so. you. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Thank you for joining us today. This is Don Evans of an Inside Source Executive Video Series. Please join us again for our next interview. Thank you. Mm -hmm.